Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, whether you're watching this live on YouTube or listening to our new podcast, which I'm very excited about, which we'll we'll talk a little bit about. Um, I apparently I look extremely red. I've just gone out for a run in my or earlier. My metabolism is just calming down. So don't don't be alarmed that I'm about to pass out live in there. It's all all in the name of exercise. So we've got an action packed show today. We're talking about some very 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 big questions about the pandemic. We're talking about, I think, issues that we've not had a proper conversation about in the media, uh, in politics, not just here in Britain, but elsewhere. Now, over 2 million people across the world have officially now died of COVID-19. We're looking at excess deaths. The actual figure may well be much, much higher. We're all well aware, of course, of the social disruption, the disruption to people's education, the mental health impacts, Uh, the huge economic consequences. This is, of course, the biggest international emergency since World War II. And ever since this pandemic began, huge challenges faced any government, of course. Uh, However prepared you're going to be for an emergency of this kind, of course, mistakes will be made and so on and so forth. But, and there was a big, big but, so many things could have been done differently, which could have saved the lives of so many people. And that's what we're talking partly about today. Are governments responsible for social murder? Now, all of a sudden, people think hyperbole, shock, throwing away term, round terms like murder seems almost vulgar and inappropriate, however much many of us may be passionately aggrieved by the failures of our government. But social murder was a term popularized by the 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Engels, best known, of course, as the closest associate of Karl Marx. And it actually, it looked at at how systemic problems in society, almost the the failures of those with power caused huge limitations to people's lives, which could be avoided. And we saw that with the mass poverty as industrialized, the industrial capitalism revolution took hold. But have we not also seen that with this pandemic. We're going to be talking about that. So just so we know who we're talking about on the show, we're talking uh, to Jamie Brown later on. He's one of the COVID-19 brief families for Justice UK. His dad died of COVID earlier on in the pandemic. We're talking to Camilla Asano, who's the co-author of a study into the pandemic in Brazil, specifically the absolute abject response to the pandemic uh, in Brazil by the far-right government of Bolsonaro. But first, I'm very glad to have Cameron Abassi, who's the executive editor of the British Medical Journal. Thanks for joining us, Cameron. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Now, Cameron, you wrote uh, an editorial in the British Medical Journal. Now, it should be said, you're the executive editor, of course, of the British Medical Journal, which is one of the most prestigious medical journals on the face of the earth. And what you do in this article is you look at whether or not social murder is an appropriate term. I mean, you you point out, uh, as you say in it, today social murder may describe the lack of political attention to social determinants and inequities that exacerbate the pandemic. And you you note Friedrich Engels, who obviously first coined, was first associated with the concept of social murder, but also as well as, uh, you know, recently two criminologists wrote to the Guardian newspaper, my my own employee, of course, mm. uh, employer, <laughs> sorry, uh, to talk about whether or not it was social murder. So just do you want to just explain, because a lot of people may hear social murder and go, calm down, this is hyperbole. So what do we mean by social murder? Yeah, I mean, I think you ex- you, you explained it very well in your introduction. I think that's what Engels meant by it. Um, I th- in broad terms, the way I'm interpreting it is to say the ruling classes, the government, do they create policies? Do they create a climate or an environment that leads to premature death amongst the poorest in society. And of course, this is something that dates back centuries. Uh, it's, 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 not, it's not a new thought or notion, although Engels captured it, I, th- I think, very well. Um, and often it, you know, it's something we, we, we rail against if we rail against inequalities, but it's been brought into absolutely sharp focus and magnif- magnified by the pandemic because the pandemic has, in many ways, targeted and sought out the poorest, the most deprived in society um, in terms of economic disadvantage, 
but also in terms of their health. And when you look at the mortality figures, they have been the most affected. So if they're the most affected and they remain the most affected, how has that happened? And when you then say, did governments get those policies right to protect those people who were the most vulnerable at the start of the pandemic? And now you look at the data and you see that the most vulnerable are the most affected, remain the ones most at risk of dying, of economic harm. And, and then you look at what governments did and say, well, actually, they didn't do what they should have done during this period. And either that was a, a deliberate act uh, or it was inaction or an act of omission, should we say. But it was all, it was all done uh, with the evidence and available to them, with the experience of other countries available to them, with historical experience available to them. Then I think you do come to the conclusion that social murder or the deaths of many, many people during this pandemic are a direct result of political decision making. And that's why it resonates with that term. I also want to use that term because this is a serious matter. We have to take this seriously. In many ways, people have just focused on the numbers, on the stats. You know, it's almost become, what does it mean to people when you say a thousand people died yesterday or 800 died or 500 dies? I, I, I think it sort of de dehumanized things. The fact is every single death has huge consequences to the family, uh, to the extended family, to, to friends, to relatives. And this needs to be taken into account. It, it, these aren't just statistics. These are deaths with huge implications. And they and many, many of them have occurred because of policymaking. And that's policymaking right from the top. I mean, you know in your editorial that half the world's death toll uh, official death toll. It's important we say it's the official death toll because it's, yeah. it's often different. I mean, in, for example, in this country, we have e excess deaths, the, the number mm -hmm. of deaths above a five-year period compared yeah. to the official yeah. death toll, and that's the same in, in lots of countries. But the official death toll in five countries, the US, Brazil, India, uh, Mexico, and Britain, that's half the world's death toll. I, I should say Britain is an outlier there because they, they all have significantly bigger populations yeah. than the UK. But what does, that, what does that tell us, those five different countries? Well, <laughs> I think there's an obvious conclusion uh, from that. I mean, they're, they're, those countries have something in common. I mean, they are all populist regimes. Um, and, and, and there is some evidence that populist leaders have undermined the response to the pandemic, haven't taken science seriously, haven't um, done what, what they were meant to do in terms of responding to the pandemic. Uh, they've often blamed the media, blamed the public, uh, and haven't been accountable, haven't taken responsibility for the decision making. So I, I think they certainly have that in common, but there's a whole bunch of things they have in common in terms of what they didn't do uh, in terms of responding to the pandemic. And I could list them all, perhaps I'll, I'll list them all in a minute. Um, but when you think of excess deaths, um, that, that, is a, that, that is the key data point. That is, that is the key metric we should measure this by. And if we just take the UK, by, if, for example, the UK had something like, and this is by estimates from the Office of National Statistics, uh, of 80,000 in 2020. And this is way out of any uh, unusually high impact flu season. This is out of the ordinary. And it also makes the UK the worst in Europe um, by quite a stretch. And a, lot of the, and a lot of that is down to what's happened in England. So on the data, we've performed horrifically. I think the U US is, is there as well. Um, India, although you would say its, it's deaths are lower, but if you compare it with other countries in, its, in South Asia, it's actually performed worse. So all of these countries have, and you will hear about Brazil later in the program, um, but all of these countries have, have had a, have a similar approach to the, to the pandemic, as I've described. What they haven't done is followed um, what, you know, the, the, the expected practice in terms of responding to a pandemic. And they've, in a way, they've pretended that they've either done the best they could or what they've done is world beating or they didn't, or nobody knew what to do. Now, none of those things are true. Um, and in a minute, as I say, I can list the things that I that, that that these countries have not done that they should have done. And there is a commonality in terms of how they then have avoided accountability for their inactions. Uh, why have they done that? It seems to me they've done it because uh, they, they're either driven by politics, 
uh, or they have made a miscalculation in terms of how to balance the economy against the health of the population. I, th I think it would be. I mean, as you say, there's a there's a the whole vast range of things that they could have done. But what, the, what get, list some, as you say, just okay, get a list. Okay, some of okay. I'm going to list these. And actually, what we should all should remember is these were equally a applicable this time last year. <laughs> okay, a year well, you know, a year ago, um, the the WHO announced a public health emergency of international concern. So all of these things should have been done. And in most of these countries that we've just talked about, they have not been done. So first of all is an aggressive containment strategy. I mean, some places it's called lockdown. Uh, in the US, they call it stay at home uh, policies. In China, they call it containment. Now, there are, of course, there are downsides of lockdown. What we want to avoid are repeated cycles of lockdown. So if you don't do it properly first time around, and then you don't do all the other things that I'm about to mention the first time around. You end up in a repeated cycle of lockdowns and, and, and spiralling deaths. And that's exactly what's happened to all of these countries, including the UK. Um, so, so what are the other things? The a fundamental of a pandemic response, and there didn't need to be any modelling, any new research to show this, is, some, is the test, trace, isolate and support strategy. We have not got this right in the UK. Um, he public health specialists have been talking about this since day one. This is something we need. It's something that people, we need, it needs to be implemented properly. Um, and it's never been effective enough. Um, initially, we didn't have the right test, the right, the, the right diagnostic tests. Then we didn't have the right contact tracing. In fact, we stopped contact tracing at one point, as ridiculous as that might, may sound, sound now. We, 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 we don't get enough people to self-isolate. And then there's the other factor, which is the, the support for people. So people who are on low incomes, who are having to work, um, the fact that if we don't support them, if they're being asked to self-isolate, means that they will avoid self-isolating or they will avoid testing. And, and that's that has ob obviously harmful implications for the transmission of the virus. So we have never got that right. Uh, we've been talking about that endlessly since for a year and it's still not fixed so that's number one number two is effective border controls uh, so if you look at the countries that have controlled uh, the virus adequately they've done all of these things and they've implemented very effective border controls and, it, and it's a little ironic it seems to me and i guess to many people that a government that was elected on its uh, kind of promise of controlling the its borders has failed to do so when it needed to do it um, the next point is around social cohesion and 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 and, and behavior um and if we think back to the first lockdown that we had in the uk i think it was very very good and generally you know i the population has very much complied with all the rules and the regulations and, and the restrictions that have been applied but initially there was there was a very strong um support for the measures and the remain the the, the Support remained strong, but it, I think it was exceptionally high at the beginning. And then we had the Dominic Cummings incident, and that eroded a lot of the trust in the public. It eroded that sense of we're in this together, and it reinforced that kind of us and them approach to things. And and so that was harmful. The next thing is clear messaging. In, in the countries that have been successful, the messaging to the public, to the professions, um, is very clear, consistent, and remains so. That's what they do in New Zealand. That's what they do in South Korea. That's what they do in Taiwan. We haven't had that here. I think anybody who says that our messaging has been clear, you know, hasn't really been paying attention. Then, and there are then there are two more factors. One is to and one is learning, and they're both related to learning lessons. So you you have to learn lessons as you go because the pandemic evolves, the virus can mutate, you can get new variants, things happen. But you have to learn as you go. We have not had that learning. We have not had. And a, a, a public inquiry, which is what people asked for in the summer. The government has refused to do that. And, and none of these countries that we talked about that, that are responsible for half of the deaths uh, uh, during this pandemic have had an inquiry of any sort whatsoever. And the final thing that you need to do, is, apart from learning from your own mistakes and what you've done, is you need to learn internationally. And this is this is almost scandalous because the lessons were there, the messages were there, the reports were available, the people to talk to were around, 
to prepare us for this pandemic. People knew it was coming. We weren't prepared for it. When it came, we saw how people responded in China. We saw how people responded in New Zealand, in Taiwan, in Vietnam, in South Korea, in other places. We didn't do what they did. So we didn't learn the lessons of history. We didn't even learn the lessons of people responding immediately to the pandemic. So if you don't do any of those things, then I'm afraid you have to take responsibility. You've done, you haven't done things that were clear, well-known, established, and should have been done. Without getting into the kind of formal politics of it, I, I think this is indicative at least of a, of a pretty fatal approach. Rishi Sunak is, of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And last September, he led the faction resisting a renewed lockdown on the 21st of September Sage called for a circuit breaker lockdown to avoid mm. catastrophic consequences, as they put it. And, and, and according to the Sunday Times' insight team, you've done excellent yeah. investigative work um, on the government's failures during the pandemic. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, brought in those scientists who repudiate the consensus, who reject the consensus on coronavirus, who pushed forcefully against lockdown. And apparently that had a big impact on Boris mm. Johnson's decision not to do so. And and the, the, the basis, the rationale is the perceived threat to the economy, the threat to the economy, which is always a false dichotomy because if you allow a public health crisis to run riot, you're going to end up with the worst economic consequences as well. And we've seen across the world, those countries that got on top of the public health crisis had the least yeah. economic impact. We've got one of the worst impacts but yeah. is that an example of what we're talking about about how human life regardless it was actually on its own terms wrong but human life was was not considered a priority over economic interests yeah i think so i think as i said i think the government let's be clear i think they have got this balance wrong i mean i think that is a perfect example i read that report i know some of the people <laughs> that went and spoke to rishi sunak and and, and boris johnson at the time it was very clear that Sage uh, was saying, and also Chris Whitty was saying, that we need a circuit breaker. Something needs to happen now. You know, things are going to get out of out of hand over the winter. We need to act now. And the government didn't. And by all by the accounts of that report, and if well, it seems genuine enough, that that's what persuaded Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak not to do what their own scientists were telling them. So. That that is a disastrous mistake because we can all see what happened over the winter. Um, if we had if we had implemented that lockdown or that circuit breaker earlier, I don't think we'd have been in the same. We'd it's still been tough. We'd have been still a tough winter. We wouldn't have had the the degree of problems that we have now. And then also, actually, I, I think if you look at the the curve of, of deaths uh, since then, the the, pan, the the restrictions were eased too quickly because. Cases were still high. A lot of people were still dying, and that and, and that second lockdown was actually lifted too early, and and then again added to the problems. So yes, that is a perfect example. But the whole pandemic response is littered with examples, such as um, immediately after the, the Dominic Cummings trip to Barnard Castle after it was exposed, we suddenly lift. We seem to very quickly ease lockdown measures over the summer before the test, trace, and isolate system was in place. We didn't use the second lockdown to put a test, trace and isolate support system in place. We aren't doing it now. So yeah, there, there have been so many mistakes, but the one you've mentioned is a, is a perfect example. Um, you write in the editorial, some attempt to defend their record by claiming that their country has done more testing, counts deaths better or more, has more obesity, population density. And we've had all of the, from Trump to government ministers yeah. saying things along those lines. All of these may contribute, but counting methods or population factors do not explain the sheer scale of the variation in performance. Now, that's an extremely important point. Mm. Is it without, in any sense, um, letting the government off the hook in this country for the worst death rate on earth apart from Belgium and Slovenia, mm. not including Gibraltar because it's not a country on its, yeah. own, on its own right, obviously. Um, it's an overseas territory. Um, but... If we look in this country, we have shocking health inequalities, which are very much baked into our economic model or a consequence of our economic model, uh, where the life expectancy of those who are poor 
is much l- lower than those who are affluent, where underlying health conditions are far more likely to affect you, of course, if you're poor than you're rich, where people of color, again, poverty and um, intersects there as well. And that's why if you're poor, you're far more likely to die of COVID-19. If you're, if you're black, you're significantly more likely to die of COVID-19 and have serious illness. And that's to do with partly it's the economic, the social inequalities that define the sort of society that's been created, which also speaks to Engels' concept of social murder. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if it's not just us saying this. If we go back to before the pandemic hit us, Michael Marmot, who's the leading voice in social determinants of health, of health with all the things you've just spoken about, Owen, um, wrote a review 10 years ago, well, 11 years ago now, but then it was a 10-year look back at his review, and he was updating his review saying what's happened since. And he was saying the economic measures that have been employed in this country um, have, uh, have, 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 have meant that the UK has fallen behind other nations um, in terms of life expectancy, inequalities have widened, uh, disadvantage is more problematic, minorities are more at risk. Um, And this is going to affect our future because who ends up suffering? There's more child poverty, children and young people, their futures are affected by this. So this was being said right as the pandemic hit us by Michael Marmot, who's, as I say, you know, the leading thinker on social determinants of health, and then the pandemic hit. So uh, this was on the back of the austerity measures that the government or previous governments had uh, had used to to con- to respond to the to, to, to the economic collapse of, of two thousand and eight, and they they directly led to the to this worsening inequality and there's and there's evidence that suggests that and Michael Marmot says that in his report that the austerity measures have led to 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 worsening inequalities and and then we, we arrive at the pandemic in in a in a pretty awful state you know inequalities probably as bad as they have been our health service stretched um and moving away from international cooperation we're then in a very vulnerable position and and then we, we haven't responded properly as a result of that. So inequalities are at the heart of this and worsening inequalities are at the heart of this. And yes, as you say, this is why we go back to the to where we started the, the, the conversation with Engels and the way inequalities are an, a major factor in driving illness, death and also worse economic uh, consequences for people who are already the poorest in society. Something else which I'm very passionate about myself and I'm glad you raised in the in the piece, and that's the role of the industry in which I work, the, the media. And you say, yet much of the media is complicit too, trapped in ideological silos that see the pandemic through a lens of political tribalism, worried about telling pandemic truths to their readers and viewers, owners and political friends. Anyone who dares to speak truth to power is unpatriotic, disloyal or a hardliner. Now, I remember actually the first phase of uh, the pandemic when, you know, we could see, we'd seen what happened in Wuhan. We could mm. see the emergency unfolding in Northern Italy. And I remember at the time, you look back kind of head in the hands, it, these comforting myths. Oh, in Northern Italy, they're older. Yeah. They live with their parents more. They kiss each other on the cheeks more. You know, it was all of this yeah. kind of stuff, which was being yeah. very comforting. Britain yeah. was obviously an international outlier at the time. And I remember, you know, the the fact that Piers Morgan, not a natural uh, cheerleader of Piers Morgan, (laughs) but for many of us, we found Piers Morgan, one of the few people in the media who was willing to speak out and challenge him. Because much of the media failed to do that. We had the BBC political editor, and this to my mind, I still cannot go over. She shared a video uh, from a podiatrist uh, named, I think he was called Footman471. I had about a thousand subscribers shared a video explaining herd immunity to popularize it using a bucket of water. Uh, and, and to, oh, yeah, to, I, I think I saw that. <laughs> it, I mean, it was just, it's just, extra, it. and it went viral. Millions yeah. of people watched that video. Uh, yeah. You know, Robert Peston, again, he kept, share, kept sharing anything Downing Street fed him, including making the case for herd immunity. And yeah. there's even, you know, there's continued examples of the media platforming so-called lockdown skeptics so, I mean, it's a pretty damning indictment, isn't it, of what much of the media, let alone the government, have done. 
Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely. I feel like the uh, much of the media has become the marketing arm of the of the government of the day of the politi- of our political leaders, and that isn't their job. The media's job is to hold the government to account. This whole conversation is about accountability. If if government and politicians, if leaders don't hold themselves to account, who can hold them to account? Well, the media have to do that, and our and our big national. Um, you know, broadcasters and newspapers and and online platforms, they have to do this because at the end of the day, who? what is this about? Is this about keeping people in power or is this about making sure that people don't die, people are healthy, the, 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 the people of the UK and in other countries, that their health improves, their well-being improves, and as a result, their prosperity improves. That's what we should be aiming for that's that's what our purpose certainly it's easier to do that when you work on a medical chair because that's that's what our focus is but i would say that the job of the media isn't to prop up the the current government or to magnify or to broadcast out their 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 their, their messaging unfiltered and that and that is an absolute tragedy that that's happened and also i mean and you talk about herd immunity and population immunity um the media also needs to you know, think for itself a little bit, you know, think, what is this herd immunity? Do we just swallow this? Is this something we should just, you know, should we just accept that as as an option? I mean, you don't, you don't just automatically then promote whatever the initiative is. Um, So, so all of that has been absolutely regrettable. And which is why, if there's a failure from the media, to some degree, there's a failure from very senior people in science and, and the professions to, either condemn the government or to re- resign when they feel the government hasn't done what they wanted them to do. Wh- where does that, ac- what can you do? Where can you turn for accountability? And this is why we start talking about legal redress because the media in many ways has failed to hold the government to account. And and that's, and that's harming the very people it's trying to sell its newspapers and its online coverage to. Finally, you talk about a public inquiry uh, in in the journal. Now, I suppose this is where I get maybe a bit cynical, that the odds of having a public inquiry that will actually hold those responsible to account rather than basically being an establishment whitewash in which we learn very, very little, which basically doesn't lead to any accountability, says, yeah, mistakes were made, and yes, we need to learn from them, but doesn't look at, say, how we ended up in Britain with one of the worst death tolls on the face of the earth, um, and and repeatedly, obviously, you know, we don't need to wait for that inquiry in a way, do we? But yeah, I mean, we <laughs> I mean, is that the issue? I mean, do you think do you think an inquiry would achieve the goal that you you set out? And and how do you think? You know, do you think the government essentially, not just here, other governments, are they basically just going to get away with it? And especially, hopefully, vaccination will lead to some form of normality. People will go, well, let's not let's not obsess on the past. We need to move on. We, you know, let bygones be bygones. What do you think? Yeah, but I, I agree with you that <laughs> I'm equally cynical about public inquiry, which is why I've, I've raised this. De- I've, I know I've done my bit now to raise the debate because I think we need to hold people to ac- make them accountable now. Um, because I share the same fear as you. That if there was a public inquiry, um, not much it would take a long time. Not what, not much would get done. The one we proposed in the BMJ, uh, Martin McKee and uh, Mike Gill proposed, uh, who are respected public health people back in the summer, was a short, sharp inquiry, forward-looking, not not apportioning blame, but looking to see what can be done now immediately over a short period. So that kind of approach we think could work. But the traditional public inquiry, yeah, no, forget that. And I think also it's it's very as you say they probably will get away with it but we need to start having that conversation now and say what is the accountability at the very least let's vote out the people that we feel have been responsible for this use your vote use use your democratic rights to 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 protest to raise your voice um, and to uh, and to demand change because that that's what we need the other things the legal redress i mean that will you know, is probably unprecedented, will take a long time. The international community might int- introduce new laws and regulations via the, um, the International Criminal Court, but all of those things will take a long time and will be there in place for the next pandemic. So, yeah, I, I share your cynicism about 
leaders getting away with it and that upsets me a lot and which is why we need to talk about it and we shouldn't be afraid of saying how serious it is and saying that this does amount to something as serious as social murder. Cameron, that was absolutely brilliant. Really, really thorough. Uh, everyone should read the editorial. Do just type in British Medical Journal social murder. You'll find it very, very quickly. And it's it really does land punches. And uh, it's very important that it starts this sort of debate and this sort of discussion. Um, so we really, really appreciate your time. Um, so thank you so, so much for joining us. Great. Thanks, Owen. Cheers, Cameron. Uh, just quickly before I bring in our, our next guest, if um, you're not watching this on YouTube, please click on through, join us, it helps support the show. I know people are watching it elsewhere, but if you just click on the YouTube link, it really helps us. Press like on YouTube, uh, that helps get the word out, uh, and press subscribe. And if you press the notification bell, you get notifications when we do these videos. For those supporting us on Patreon, we really appreciate it. That's how we're doing more and more of these videos. We're expanding. We've now got a podcast, which I'll mention. Uh, and for those who are supporting us, thank you. For those who want to support us, just go to Patreon forward slash Owen Jones uh, 84. Uh, and also, if you want to put, uh, we've got two fantastic guests to come. Do you want to support the show in other ways? You can use Super Chats, the little dollar sign on YouTube. Uh, you can put questions using that function, help support the show as well. And please do on uh, listen to this listen via podcast. If you type in the Owen Jones podcast, online on itunes or spotify or elsewhere then you can listen to these in audio format and we've got some exclusive stuff coming out as well after all that let me bring in our next fantastic guest who we're very very lucky to have uh, camilla asano is the co-study of a study look looking at the response of the brazilian government the far-right government of course of bolsonaro uh, she's the co-author of, of this critical study. Over 231,000 people have officially died in Brazil since the pandemic began. It's one of the worst affected countries on earth. Should be said, doesn't have a death rate as bad as Britain, which uh, doesn't let Brazil off the hook. It just shows how horrific the situation is here. Camilla, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Owen. Thank you for having me here and having this opportunity to share the findings of our research and the study. So just to, and it's a pleasure to have you, just to kind of, just this line, which really is really very striking. Our research has revealed the existence of an institutional strategy to spread the virus promoted by the Brazilian government under the leadership of the president of the Republic. Do you want to just explain what was meant by that? Sure. So in this research, what we did is a partnership of Connectus Human Rights, that's a Brazilian NGO working with human rights, and the University of Sao Paulo, the center research from the public health faculty, um, CPGISA, and we joined forces to analyze, to map and analyze all the regulatory, the regulation from the federal government um, as a response to the pandemic. So basically, we had a team of researchers analyzing daily the production of laws, um, executive orders or per, uh, per, provisional measures, um, decrees, decisions, resolutions. So in different levels from you know, law to these decisions that were all produced by the federal government um, as part of the response to the pandemic. And analyzing all of these, and in the end, we analyzed more than 3,000 um, norms I would call generally uh, norms. And what we saw is the findings of the research. So the first one is, and this is a very important message that we wanted to spread to the world that um, it's not correct to reduce Bolsonaro's response to the pandemic as a neglection or an omission, or just saying that, well, he could have done more, but he decided to do nothing. This is part, a small part, if I may say, of um, the reasons why Brazil is the second uh, highest COVID-19 death rate in the world and considering, according to some research, one of the worst response to the pandemic. So doing nothing is one part, and I may say just uh, one part of, of this. But one of, uh, we had three findings of this research that will come to that conclusion that you mentioned, Owen. So the first one is Bolsonaro, uh, President Bolsonaro proactively decided to um, 
veto or adopt measures that in the end didn't contain the spread of the virus, but instead was promoting actions and behaviors that were spreading the virus. So this is one of uh, the findings that we saw analyzing these 3,000 norms produced since March 2020 until um, January this year. The second finding is that Bolsonaro was also blocking measures that state or municipal uh, governments adopted to protect population from the pandemic. So it wasn't that he was just adopting measures that were spreading, and I'll give you some examples, um, but he was also blocking and obstructing when governors, for instance, were trying to impose some measures to curb and contain uh, the pandemic. And the third finding is that wh while we were analyzing these 3,000 um, norms, we organized in our study a timeline. And when you put in this timeline, the measures with speeches from the president Bolsonaro to the press, to followers or uh, in his Twitter, um, you, we can link and see that was, and that's the third finding of the research, a propaganda against public health. When he is claiming that, well, this is just a little flu, so there's no need to use masks or uh, promoting you know, medicines and remedies that are unproven to be used as a treatment for COVID and uh, actually some concern about being you know, harmful for the health of people, but he was um, fostering the population to use and even um, giving directions for doctor, medical doctors to use it. So uh, when we use sum up all of these findings in the end, what we have is that Bolsonaro's actions did not contain the spread of the virus. Quite on contrary, it actually facilitated. So um, it is true that there was an intentional um, way of uh, behavior of blocking and measuring measures that could help people. So um, this is a very um, concerning uh, conclusion of, of our study because in the end we have this large number of deaths, but so many avoidable deaths, mm -hmm. especially because Brazil we have the universal public health system. So I'm not saying that it's a perfect or one of the best, but we um, had uh, all the conditions to deal with the pandemic in a much better way if it wasn't President Bolsonaro's active uh, intervention in so many um, cases to, instead of supporting measures to contain the virus, actually he was blocking measures that could protect the population in this pandemic crisis. I mean, you spoke in the research of a constant war being waged against governors and mayors who were trying to implement measures to prevent and fight the virus. So it'd be interesting to hear a bit more about that. And also, linked to this, um, in Manaus, is that how I pronounce it? Is it Manaus? I'm never sure how to pronounce it. Manaus. Manaus, in Brazil. You're almost there. <laughs> almost there. So this is a city <laughs> over 2 million. Uh, it's by the rainforest. And it had such an initial awful outbreak that many people thought it was one of the only places on earth to have achieved herd immunity. But then what happened is it was hit by a second wave in which a new variant of COVID, one of the very disturbing variants of COVID-19 uh, have emerged, which poses a big threat to the global, not just Brazil, the global public health response to it. And that's the other thing, isn't it? Because the warning was always... If you allow the virus to run amok, it increases the risk of variants which can evade vaccines and treatments and which can prevent us going back to some sort of normality. And Brazil's catastrophic approach, like Britain, it has to be said, made those variants more likely for which the world then has to pay. Yeah, so one of the, the findings of our research is how there was this kind of war from declared by President Bolsonaro to governors that were trying, some of the governors, not all of them, were trying to establish some measures to contain 
um, the pandemic. So one is closing uh, businesses. So this is what we never use the word lockdown here, but there was a moment that governor decided to shut down and to close um, shops that are not considered essential activities. What Bolsonaro did, he adopted a decree or he signed, because he's the president, so he has the pen, he holds the pen, he signed a decree expanding the list of essential activities to include gym and sports centers, to include beauty saloons as essential uh, activities. Because um, when we had this kind of between commas lockdown here in Brazil, there are still you know markets, supermarkets open, pharmacies open. Uh, but as this decree included gyms and beauty saloons as part of it, it was also uh, a way to um, under diminish the, the, the measures taken by some of the governors. In the case of Manaus, Manaus is the capital of the state of Amazonas in the north of Brazil. And like Manaus is kind of the open to, to the rainforest, the open door, and it's the door for, for the rainforest. And it's a big city, as you, you mentioned, two million people, the population, so it's a big city, but quite isolated because of geography, um, so you cannot reach other capitals by road, it's only by river, so it's really hard to um, deliver supplies in, in Manaus. And um, we had the first case in the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, Manaus was one of the worst city cases in Brazil. And we had people from Bolsonaro's cabinet saying that no we're gonna see because they are reaching this herd immunity and this is our case study but it's been proven that there is no herd immunity and um, the governor of Amazonas where Manaus is the capital in, in, in early December decided to impose a new lockdown because he was seeing that was this second wave that here in Brazil, it's hard to call it second wave because it seems like it was only the same tsunami since the beginning. And uh, the governor by decree also um, imposed uh, a new lockdown. And there was demonstrations for from business person and going to the street and organizing march against closing uh, shops and closing businesses. And because of this pressure, the governor uh, went back and, and canceled the, the lockdown. And this is what we are seeing now. So the number of deaths is increasingly increasing. And we had these horrible scenes of families begging for oxygen and people dying in hospitals because there is no oxygen supply. And uh, it was it's quite complicated to uh, send oxygen supply because it cannot go, you know, by uh, by road because you don't reach Manaus by road. So it had to be by planes. And there's a whole security measure. So a specific kind of plane can transport the oxygen supply. So in the end, we, had, uh, we still don't know how much lives we lost because of this um, crisis of oxygen supply. And the Minister of Health went to Manaus a few days before this crackdown of uh, oxygen supply. So it, it was all aware, including there is an investigation um, investigating the Minister of Health, that's the armed general, because again, in Brazil, we are having a far right um, president that in put military staff with high la in high, la high level ranks in high level positions in his cabinet. So the Minister of Health today in Brazil is an armed uh, general with no previous experience in health crisis. And he was chosen because he was supposed to be good in logistic. But if you look what happened in Manaus, well, logistic for sure wasn't uh, there. Finally, I mean, you said in the report that the situation in Brazil would be even more tragic if other Brazilian institutions hadn't stopped um, many of the, the measures which were encouraging the spread of the virus by the Brazilian government. So just know that finally on that, and, and, and secondly, what, what now for Brazil? How, how optimistic are you? I mean, I've seen Bolsonaro spreading anti-vax type sentiments suggesting if people inject uh, if people get the vaccine they'll turn into alligators i don't even know what to say it didn't just, happen so far 
Yeah, just to be, to be absolutely clear to everyone watching, no one yeah. has been turned into an alligator no. uh, as things stand because of the vaccine. Very important to make clear there was no evidence base for transforming into an alligator. And I mean, you know, is there hope for Brazil given, I mean, what what where does the vaccination program stand? Obviously, a lot of the global south, there's lots of big questions regardless of who's in charge. So what on those two things, you know, just how actually it could have been worse, but actually is there still worse to come? It's very bad and it's very serious, but could be worse if democratic institutions weren't blocking these um, measures from the from President Bolsonaro. So um, at Connect Us, we are all the time analyzing from the human rights perspective, the Bolsonaro response to the pandemic. And we have to be aware that Bolsonaro was before the pandemic, an authoritarian populist leader. And before the pandemic, he was even at the election campaign in 2018, when he was elected in 2018 and took office in 2019. So when he was elected, his electoral platform was uh, anti-rights and talking about, well, there's too much right for those minority groups. So he was being questioning and in the end, when he took office, he put in practice uh, a policy to remove constitutional rights from the population, from indigenous people, from quilombolas, from, you know, uh, people uh, deprived of liberty in the prisons because Brazil has a mass incarceration rate, uh, migrants and refugees. So if we look at this um, platform of removing human rights from especially vulnerable groups, um, it's, it's comparable that when Bolsonaro started to deal with the pandemic, because it took a while for him to deal in, in this disastrous way, but the the human rights perspective of it, it's really a disaster. So first one um, is the right to health. So we have the second highest COVID-19 death rate. So he's failing in protecting the right to life as the basic human rights. Also vulnerable groups, and he's he was neglecting protection for these people before pandemic. So during the pandemic, it didn't change. So only the Supreme Court or the Congress forced Bolsonaro to take measures. So when we think about, you know, all the measures for the indigenous population, it was the Supreme Court combined with the Congress that uh, are the responsible for forcing Bolsonaro to take some of the measures. They are not, not enough, but some of these measures taking was because of uh, what the institutions, as you, you mentioned, uh, one of the uh, quotes from our research says that. So if it wasn't the Congress, there would be probably any preventive measures. If it was for the indigenous people, if it wasn't the, the Supreme Court, it would we perhaps wouldn't have a national plan for vaccination. That's your, your, your second question, because uh, the government uh, was just saying, oh, no, no, don't worry. When, when the time comes, when we have the vaccines, people will be vaccinated and we will show the plan once we have the vaccines here. What kind of planning is this? And we're talking about pandemic. So um, the government only presented the national plan for vaccination because the Supreme Court forced the administration to do so. And uh, you asked me how how is the perspectives for vaccination in Brazil? It, it's it's a nightmare because we should be in a so much different level now. So it's less than 2% of the population um, vaccinated so far, and we are still struggling to have the, the, the products to come from China to produce the two vaccines approved here that we have from the CoronaVac and the Oxford AstraZeneca. So we, we are not an autonomous, we don't have autonomy in production. We still need to get the supply coming from abroad, coming from China. And Brazil is one of the countries that has a long-term history of experience and expertise in vaccinating and even exporting vaccines and exporting this know-how. And now because of this uh, policy of 
denying science, denying public health system, uh, we are where we are now. So there is no even you know perspective uh, for the young people. Like I, I don't even know if this year I'll, I'll be able to get. Uh, my chance to be vaccinated. And on the other hand, Bolsonaro is always saying, no, we cannot stop economy. And this was since the day one of the pandemic in Brazil. We cannot stop economy. We cannot just save lives. He was always saying, we need to save the Brazilian economy. And putting economic um, interests above human lives is is the, you know, the main uh, logic of the Bolsonaro's response to, to, to the pandemic. And what we saw as well is in, in this human rights perspective is um, that for all the measures that could save lives, Bolsonaro was saying that, okay, this is not that serious. So he was being minimizing the crisis. But when uh, it was a good excuse to foster some of his authoritarian measures, the pandemic was serious enough. So to close borders and not allow any refugee to cross the land borders, uh, oh, because the pandemic is here, it's too serious, so we cannot allow any refugees to cross our land borders. Oh, because of the pandemic, all the detainees will not have in-person hearings with the judge to see if he, the person was um, suffered torture, for instance. Let's just do it in a virtual um, hearing because the pandemic is too serious. Or even one of the first measures of Bolsonaro uh, when the pandemic started here in Brazil in, in, early, in late March uh, was to kind of suspend the access to information law in Brazil saying that, you know, because of the pandemic, let's suspend and uh, put on hold the pub access to public information law, which doesn't make sense. And the Supreme Court decided to block this decision. So going back to your, your first question. And what you expect here, I don't know, I think um, the situation is getting worse and worse. And Bolsonaro now um, has two more years of his presidency and uh, we've been seeing in his speech and also in the actions he's been taking that's going to be tougher. He's going to uh, go more and more against uh, human rights and individual rights. So it's urgent in Brazil to have serious investigation of the responsibility of Bolsonaro and his ministers and all um, the officials involved in the response because of all the, the, the findings we mentioned in, the, in our joint research, but also for, for this responsible to be held accountable. So if it doesn't happen, uh, we will double the death years and also these authoritarian measures that were taken use in the pandemics as, a, as an excuse perhaps would be, you know, last longer and longer and stay here. And uh, the pandemic, uh, I mean, not the pandemic, but Bolsonaro in the pandemic was horrible for public health, for the life of people and for democracy in Brazil. So of course, life are uh, the most important and precious thing, but democracy is also being seriously attacked as we have Bolsonaro as a president. Camilla, we really appreciate you having joined us and your absolutely crucial research in holding the Brazilian authorities to account for the horrific loss of death in Brazil and lots of things we can learn from in our own catastrophe <laughs> here in here in Britain. And it's very important that, you know, we we learn from the the horrors unleashed by our own government's catastrophic respective uh, handlings of the of the pandemic and the overlapping reasons. Bolsonaro is a far cruder and more extreme example than, than our own right-wing populist government, but there are there are echoes which are disturbing enough on their own terms. So we really, really appreciate you and thanks for your research and, and taking time to talk to us. No, I thank you for again inviting me here and also if I may just ask uh, the international audience to really pay attention to what's happening in Brazil. It's very important. And solidarity with Brazil. And, and I, I hope everyone who's watching or listening to this does, does exactly that.
Cheers, Camilla. Bye. Thank you. So in Britain now, the official death toll is over 112,000 people who died because of COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic about a year ago. Now, all too often, they're statistics, aren't they? Numbers. Every day we get the same ritual of a death toll, hundreds or well over a thousand a day for long periods of this second wave, this cruel, unrelenting second wave of the pandemic, even now is it. Those numbers come down because of a belatedly imposed lockdown. The human carnage should not be underestimated. Every single person behind is every single statistic, I should say, uh, has a human being behind them. And every human being who dies leaves a huge imprint on the lives of those who love them, who are left behind. And that human side of the pandemic is all too often, we've not spoken about it. It has just been a story of numbers, inhuman numbers, stats and and, and figures. Now, the f- some of the families of those who've died are trying to fight for justice. And there is an organization called the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice UK who've been uh, founded in order to fight for exactly that. And I'm very lucky to have Jamie Brown, who's from COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice UK, joining me today. Uh, let's bring Jamie in. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Dan. Hello. Hi. Good evening. So, Jamie, first of all, losing your dad is tough. It's hard in the best of times. Uh, losing it, losing your dad in in this in these circumstances is is particularly hard. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about your dad first? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's interesting. I think for everyone in the media, it's uh bringing people like me on is is a reminder of the the human cost it's also i think funny for me to do these interviews and talk mostly about the political circumstances of my dad's death rather than him as a person um my dad was a really wonderful man uh he was 65 his name's tony brown he's a month away from retirement he'd moved in anticipation of that retirement and my mum moved down to the east coast down to essex um he was still doing one day a week in london uh, for work, um, but very, very nearly about to put his feet up. Um, Dad was an engineer. He travelled up to London for the last time for work on the 12th of March. So a good couple of weeks before we went into proper lockdown first time around. And uh, by all accounts, uh, subsequently, a good couple of weeks after Boris Johnson had all the information he needed to encourage him to have an urgent first lockdown. But Again, by those accounts, it sounds like he was trying to sort out his divorce. Um, and so I overlooked it. Uh, my dad fell ill a few days later. Um, uh, by the 28th of uh, March, he'd called 111 a few times. Um, they'd basically said, take paracetamol and give us a call back if it gets worse, without anyone really being able to tell you what worse would look like or feel like or sound like. Um, and in the meantime, all the media and our prime minister telling us that COVID-19 was a, a mild illness unless you had uh, severe existing um, uh, risk factors, you should be fine. So you ought to stay at home. Everyone should stay home. Stay home and protect the NHS. So he did. And on the 28th of March, um, it seemed that he was getting breathless and feeling worse. Uh, they called 111 in the morning. Um, after he'd struggled to stay through the night and been nauseous. Uh, they assessed him again over the phone, uh, told him, uh, you're not an emergency, but we'll send an ambulance to come pick you up shortly. A couple of hours later, an ambulance arrives. They took him downstairs. They checked his oxygen levels. Uh, he had 85% oxygen at that time. Uh, he managed to get downstairs by himself, unaided, back of an ambulance, taken off to Colchester General. Uh, I think he was, he'd arrived at the hospital, he was there for maybe five minutes before um, he died after having a massive cardiac arrest brought on by respiratory failure because the virus had already been in him and beating up his lungs uh, for the past couple of weeks um, to the point where he couldn't breathe. Um, and whilst all this is going on, this is still quite early doors, um, just watching government news conferences every day telling you what a wonderful job they're doing. It's all quite difficult. And Jamie, thanks for sharing that story with with us and um, my love and solidarity. 
In terms of COVID-19 bereaved families for Justice UK, do you want to explain why it was set up and what its aims are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, we were in a, a collection, or oh, sorry, we still are a collection of bereaved families um, initially set up around, shortly after the time my dad died, um, around April time. Um, essentially, I think the initial co-founders of the group were feeling like me. They were they were sad and they were angry and they couldn't believe that we were being told uh, essentially just lies every night that, um, as we are more recently, that our politicians were doing everything they could to keep us safe, um, whilst even in the first waves, the death numbers were going up and up and up. And becoming acutely aware quite quickly that um, whilst you're grieving for your own loss, there's a, a kind of... Um, a rapidly increasing number of people across the country who are, who are experiencing their losses. And, and it felt something had to be done. Um, we've got a couple of aims, but they're very basic, really. Uh, firstly, is to stop the further loss of life um, and stop people having to go what we, through what we've been through, primarily. Um, and then second is accountability and transparency for decisions that were made. And also, in, in this process, we're calling for greater support for uh, bereavement support for families um, who've been struggling. Now, how we get there is 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 has been the focus of the campaign. We're now two thousand five hundred uh, families, I believe, um, and that's been going up and up since April. As I say, uh, every day with new people posting new stories in the Facebook group that we have. Um, so the objective to call for firstly a review of of our policy, a rapid review of our policy, um, has been our our overarching goal since June. So. Since June, we've been writing to the Prime Minister. We've written to him six times, I believe, to ask initially for a meeting and to call for a public inquiry with a rapid review uh, into the, the, the handling of this pandemic. And six times we've been reviewed, refused, uh, including one lie in Parliament to suggest that we were in litigation with the government and he couldn't meet with us when we never happened. How does that make you feel when, when they refuse to meet, meet with you? It's it's I guess um, just symptomatic of of a a, a particularly arrogant um, uh, and ignorant leadership. Really, um, it's very distressing. It's, when you're it, it should be noted. I think first that none of this has been a, a combative approach. The idea has been that we know we need to work with the people in charge to review what we're doing. And actually suggest that each one of us has our own insights into firsthand what has been going wrong. So the, 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 the reviews have been truly quite insulting um, uh, and exhausting. Like, a, it, it's, it's weird to be caught between trying to want to save people's lives uh, and prevent more of this happening and being met with this kind of utter defensiveness. Um, which is just so unhelpful. <laughs> when you hear government ministers or media outlets say, well, of course, mistakes have been made, but this was an unprecedented crisis. Um, we were dealt a terrible hand. The best was done by government. What, what, do you, what does that make you think? Uh, completely infuriated. It's, just, it's so disgusting to, <laughs> um, to lie to people like that. Uh, particularly to bereaved families who, who know full well that you haven't. Um, it's been exasperating. And and I, even at the start of this pandemic, I've, I've heard, I was on a call recently with Keir Starmer, who I guess tried to take a similar tone to start with in that um, no one was expecting us to get everything right first time. But frankly, if you didn't get this right first time, if you didn't follow... Uh, guidance from WHO, if you didn't follow examples of countries that were doing this well, you were always going to end up with thousands of people dying. So the 20,000 number would have been a good result. Great, 20,000 people would have been dead. And sure, all of us would have taken that over the 100 odd thousand we're at now. Um, but yes, I find it insulting and counterproductive to not be honest at this stage of the pandemic of, of what's been going wrong. Um, is is is, is going to be fatally dangerous and will lead to further deaths. In terms of a public inquiry, do you fear that there may well be one, which is basically an establishment whitewash? It will take years and years, like many 
public inquiries have done. And at some point in the future, maybe when the current people in charge aren't in charge, it will do this, yes, well, mistakes were made kind of uh, approach when it's too late anyway for any accountability. Yes, and if you do hear any of Boris Johnson's comments on the need for a kind of an independent inquiry of some point at some stage, then that points exactly to that sort of scenario. Um, what we've been calling for is a statutory public inquiry. Uh, so first of all, judge-led, it should be someone who's not directly appointed by um, by the Prime Minister and the scope of which should not be set out necessarily by the ruling party who could deflect attention from things that they know that they've done wrong. Um, what we and, and and firstly would sorry, sorry secondly we're not calling for this to be five years down the line because we know that won't help anyone um it certainly won't help prevent further deaths before we all get vaccinated so we are trying and desperately encouraging the government to have a rapid review as was done uh back after the hillsborough disaster in the, the it's called the taylor review an 11-week review of what what could be done in stadiums to stop people getting crushed at football matches, which was completed and implemented before the next season started. There is precedent for doing this um, through a public inquiry route. And also, whilst there's a term that's thrown around, the WHO themselves is calling for countries to conduct their own, um, they call them intra-action reviews, basically to, to review what you're doing and make sure you don't kill any more people. Just finally, Jamie, what would you like people who are watching or listening to this to do in support? What what kind of what what can people because a lot of people would be very moved by your story and also generally feel quite angry about the pandemic. There are people, of course, who've lost relatives as well who'll be watching or listening to this. What can people do? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's a few ways that we, we would love your support. We would love to hear from you. We would love you to get involved because, frankly, these things don't happen merely just through um, small groups. We need both public pressure and we are raising funds for legal action as well, should it be needed. Um, so you can find out more um, about us by following us at COVID Justice UK on Twitter. If you yourself have breathed um, and have lost someone, firstly, my heart goes out to you. Welcome to this terrible club. Um, but you can join our Facebook group where we function initially in the first instance as a essentially a support network for other people who are going through it was an extremely lonely experience. Um, you can join there. Uh, and also, if you follow uh, us on to um, our website, covidfamiliesforjustice.org, we have both a petition with over 200,000 signatures on so far um, and a crowdfunder page where, let's say, we're raising funds to support the campaign for what, um, as you've rightly pointed out, may well be a long um, a long slog to get to any form of, of justice. And we'd greatly appreciate anyone to join us there. And I'll be plugging those on social media, not least the crowdfunder, so important to support the struggle of, 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 of this campaign. Jamie, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, it was incredibly moving and obviously loving and solidarity to you and and to to everybody else. My, as I'll mention afterwards, to my own relatives died, not not close relatives uh, from COVID nineteen, and uh, you know I can see the terrible impact it has on on people around them when when people lose their relatives to this terrible illness, and so many so many tens of thousands of those deaths were completely avoidable if things had been done differently by a government, which decided to put the economy before human life and ended up destroying both. Uh, so we really appreciate it, Jamie, and it's such an important cause, such an important struggle, and uh, I hope everyone watching or listening to this will do everything they can to support you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank Cheers, you. Jamie. Take care now. And I do want to say, actually, I mean, it was so moving listening to Jamie. Um, you know, I, th I think of, just to give you an example of my own family, um, Maureen and Colin uh, were two, were a married couple together for many decades. Maureen was my dad's cousin. And my dad was an only child. Um, and she was like his sister. Uh, he's absolutely loved Maureen. I've spent time with both Maureen and Colin when I was growing up. Very fond memories of, of both of them. The last time I saw Maureen was at my dad's funeral in, in 2018. And tragically, uh, Colin died from COVID-19. And 
and then Maureen died two weeks later. Um, terrible impact, obviously, on on a family to lose to lose both uh, within such a short space of time for this terrible illness. There's so many stories like that. I know so many, so many incredibly moving stories like those of Jamie to lose your dad, only 65 years old. So it's a it's a terrible tragedy, and it's so important that we do humanize the statistics that are constantly flung at us. I mean that in a in a perverse way, having such a high death toll can make it harder to just imagine each individual person who dies. You know, if you see some horrible news of a terrible traffic accident in which five people die, which is a horrible thing to have to watch on the news, and you see their faces flash up and there's a kind of connection and an impact. And yet when we've got, according to excess deaths, about 115,000 people dead in this country, it becomes harder to imagine each and every human life and also how many people knew and loved those people. Uh, so it's so important that we do that, that we, we do have humanity uh, when we have these conversations and not just fling statistics around in ways that don't really just show the, the true horror of, 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 human, of the loss of human life. And it wasn't. It was completely avoidable. They locked down too late, repeatedly. They messed up test and trace. Uh, handing it to private contractors who made a shambolic pig's ear of the whole thing. They listened to lockdown skeptic scientists. Like, yes, I'm thinking of you, Rishi Sanak, the chancellor uh, of the Exchequer. Uh, they they faffed around over Christmas. They encouraged mixing at Christmas. I mean, the litany of horrors goes on. And that's why we ended up with one of the worst death tolls on the face of the earth, not because we were unlucky. And that's why it is important we talk about social murder. And I'm glad we've been able to have a discussion with, with those two experts and, well, three experts, uh, the, the executive editor of the British Medical Journal, who wrote such a powerful editorial, uh, a, a leading Brazilian researcher, just shows the horror of a far-right government on, during a pandemic in Brazil and the terrible consequences, and then hearing from Jamie on behalf of so many families who've, who've lost loved ones. And to those of you who've lost loved ones, because I know people watch and listen to this, uh, my love and my solidarity. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, it was a long show. But it's an important show. It's important we have these conversations. And I hope it'd be good to get this out far and wide. So if you're watching us on YouTube, do press like and subscribe. If you're if you're listening on the podcast, give us five stars. That helps encourage other people to watch it, to listen to it even. Uh, all support on Patreon is really appreciated so we can expand and do more videos, documentaries and so on. Patreon, full slash Owen Jones 84. Really appreciate everyone who watched or listened. And we will be back if, on the YouTube uh, live on Thursday at seven o'clock. And then that will be on the podcast uh, first thing in the morning on Friday uh, and next Sunday again at five o'clock. Uh, also, uh, we've got some absolutely fantastic guests who were interviewing this week and it is eclectic i promised from the beginning we would have a very broad range of people uh to speak to uh so we have uh paul krugman who is the nobel prize winning economist gail porter a tv presenter who's been very open about her struggles uh with mental health dr shola moz uh shog babamu uh who has a book out a brilliant absolutely uh critical book uh out uh, about racism and white supremacy um, which is called, let me get the title right, one second. Let me just make sure, yes, that's right. This is why I resist, don't define my black identity. Uh, and also Jack Monroe, who is the anti-poverty campaigner, cook extraordinaire, uh, an all-round good egg. So we've got lots of people to speak to. So thanks as ever. Uh, spread, the, spread the word, get everyone to watch or listen to this. And I will see or listen to you all the way through next week on the YouTube channel and on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And I will see you very soon.